All right, so uh, what we're going to do today, this was originally uh, scheduled as a special online class, but as mentioned in the announcement, that was right after the exam. Uh, I was probably still suffering effects from the concussion when I made up that syllabus. So we're going to move uh, a special online class to the 30th, uh, and we're just going to continue on with uh, the other schedule as uh, indicated. So uh, just bear that in mind as we go through. We still will have one last uh, catch-up um, class. And then also before we begin uh, today's um, class, just want to uh, let everybody know that the SNPI assignments now have been graded, and uh, those are available in, uh, in Canvas. And uh, I have been contacted by some students um, who have uh, mentioned that uh, for the uh, intermittent schedules, for the fixed ratio, fixed interval, variable ratio, variable interval schedules, that they um, may have submitted the wrong uh, file to the wrong assignment. Um, however, that is part of the assignment. So when you're asked to do a fixed ratio schedule, you need to submit a file that is a fixed ratio schedule. So uh, that needs to be part of that. Otherwise, there's no way for me to tell if you really know what a fixed ratio, fixed interval, variable ratio, variable interval schedule is. Now, the good news uh, for those of you that may have done that is that uh, there is that sniffy last chance uh, redemption deadline uh, where you can resubmit your sniffy assignments for partial credit. So this is open to anybody that really had difficulty with the sniffy assignments that is scored 49% or less on your sniffy assignments. So check your Canvas grades and for anything that you scored less than that on your sniffy assignment, you can resubmit that and again, the reason that limitation is in there is that it's for partial credit, so you can earn up to half of the points that you uh, might have missed, and uh, that way that you can uh, uh, basically uh, make up for uh, part of the credit that you uh, didn't earn. All right, so just be aware of that. Uh, check the syllabus for the deadline. I believe it's uh, in nine or ten days is the Snippy Last Chance deadline. And then uh, you submit them through Canvas, you submit them to the Sniffy Last Chance Deadline um, assignment tab. And uh, after that deadline, I'll go through those, grade those, and uh, update your uh, grade to the final um, uh, version. All right, so what we're going to be doing uh, today is uh, we're going to start a new idea, uh, which is observational learning and rule-governed behavior. So today we're going to focus on observational learning or social learning, the learning that occurs just by observing uh, other individuals. We'll talk about operational learning in classical conditioning and how it affects uh, classical conditioning. We'll talk about operational learning in operant conditioning, uh, specifically fact oh, there it is, specifically factors that affect the acquisition of the knowledge that you are learning, and then also factors that affect the performance of the behavior that you're learning. So acquisition is learning uh, to uh, do the behavior, performance is actually doing that particular behavior. And then if we got time, uh, we'll wrap it all up with a look at uh, the bystander effect and a possible observational learning explanation for that uh, phenomenon. But before we uh, get to that, uh, I need to show you a few things. So this is a picture of my daughter back when she was about uh, one and a half years old. And uh, in and around that time uh, in our household, uh, we watched a uh, cartoon uh, called Shira. So uh, if you've never uh, experienced the wonder that is Shira, I'll just give you a brief uh, intro here. So this is the intro to Shira. It's been rebooted uh, by Netflix. And if you think I'm excited about the reboot, you are correct. But this is the original version. Uh, that came out back in the 80s. I am Adora, Dunan's twin sister and defender of the Crystal Castle. This is Spirit, my big brother Steve. Fabulous secrets were revealed to me the day I held aloft my sword and said, For the honor of Grayskull! Only 
a few other shared secrets. Among them are Nightfall, Madame Raz, and Cowl. Together, we and my friends of the Great Rebellion strive to free Syria from the evil forces of Horda. All right, so I showed you that so I can show you this. Uh, that show was on um, in our house uh, around the time that I just showed you uh, Isabella's picture. So we would have that on, we would sit around, lounge, uh, watch a little bit of She-Ra. And uh, what happened uh, in a, one uh, visit to a, uh, to a park around here, so this is the park right next to the zoo. What happened was when we were there and Isabella was playing, uh, she picked up a stick, and then all of a sudden she started doing this uh, with the stick. And this was a behavior that we had never taught her to do. This was a behavior that we had never uh, reinforced her for doing. Uh, this was a behavior that she was never under any sort of operational contingency in order to do. And apparently she learned it very well because this happened. So that was her Halloween costume. But anyways, the question is... Why was she doing this behavior when it was never reinforced? And the answer, as we're going to see, is through observational learning. So while that program was on and while Isabella was, you know, viewing that, uh, that cartoon, through simple observation of she she acquired and then performed that particular behavior of uh, holding aloft her mighty sword and saying, by the, for the honor of Graceful. All right, so we're going to take a look at how that uh, uh, observational learning um, occurs. And then we're also going to take a look at applications of observational learning, uh, specifically a couple of applications in popular culture. So one of those, um, we've, we've seen this before, uh, has to do with movies and uh, specifically horror movies. So in horror movies, one of the things that oftentimes uh, occurs is you have a group of people that go into a situation where you know they shouldn't be in that situation, but they go up there anyway, and uh, slowly they get picked off one by one. So if you haven't seen Cabin in the Woods, um, I highly recommend it if you're a fan of horror films. It subverts a lot of stuff. I don't want to say too much more uh, other than that, but it's a highly enjoyable uh, ride. But it has your classic cast of characters, and uh, if you know anything about the slasher horror genre, you know they're going to get picked off one by one. And further than that, you know who's going to survive to the end. So you know out of these one, these archetypes, who's going to be that last person standing? Who's going to be that last person that has that satisfying battle with that evil entity or that monster that's, that's uh, you know, trying to take out the entire group? So hands up. Uh, let's see if... If people here are familiar with it, hands up if you think that it is the uh, muscular high school uh, jock. You're right, he's toast. He's not going to last it to the end of the film. Uh, do you think it's the uh, nerdy science student? No, you're right, he's not going to last either. Uh, the promiscuous uh, female cheerleader? Yeah, she's toast. Um, the stoner? Yeah, he's toast. How about the, uh, the virtuous uh, reserved girl? Yeah, so she's going to survive, and she's going to be the one that takes on the monster in the end. And this is uh, a trope that's been used over and over again. This is known as the final girl. So uh, what happens in the final girl is basically uh, while her friends are getting murdered, she is fearful for her life the entire movie, but then gets backed into a corner where she makes that final stand against the villain, and it's a very satisfying uh, ending, typically, to these horror films. And they've even, even made uh, movies about the last final girl. So um, we're going to see why this trope exists uh, and why how observational learning fits into uh, this idea of having that final girl as a survivor. We're also going to see talk a little bit about gender equality and who in our society is allowed to be brave after showing fear, and who in our society is not. And spoiler alert, men are not uh, allowed to be brave after showing fear. So we're gonna see how all that ties in. And then the last analysis we're gonna do is what I like to call the curious case of the Black Widow. 
So the Black Widow in the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, has not had her own film yet and has been severely sort of ignored considering that she was established in Iron Man 2, that's when she made her debut, and she was uh, used in the first Avengers film. So the Marvel Cinematic Universe has uh, this year celebrated 10 years of making films, and she was introduced very early on and yet still has not been used uh, you know, in a solo adventure. So the question we're gonna take a look at is, why was she introduced, especially when there were multiple other female characters in the Marvel Universe that would have been a better or more justified addition to the Avengers than the Black Widow. Why was the Black Widow picked? And we're gonna see that it also has to do with this idea of observational learning. All right, so observational learning. Uh, this is um, the phenomenon. We're gonna see why it occurs, but this is the phenomenon where the behavior of a model is witnessed by an observer. So the model is doing something and an observer is witnessing it. Shira is lifting her sword, she's the model. Isabella's watching the episode, she's the observer. And just because of that observation, the observer's behavior is subsequently changed. All right, so this is the phenomenon of observational learning. So again, we have the model that is doing the behavior, we have the observer that is viewing the behavior, and simply because of viewing the behavior, that observer's behavior subsequently changes. So we have behavior change, uh, and uh, this is done not because of reinforcement, not because of classical conditioning, this is done because of simply observing that other uh, model doing that particular behavior. So observational learning does touch on both operational conditioning and classical conditioning. So uh, one of the areas where observational learning um, is uh, uh, or, or ties into classical conditioning has to do with emotional responses. So there is an observational learning uh, phenomenon called vicarious emotional responses. And this is the phenomenon where your emotional response is oftentimes similar to um, your observed emotions, right? So if you see somebody who's happy, it makes you happy. That's a vicarious emotional response. You have not just won the lottery. You have not just received good news. Uh, so you're not um, experiencing that emotion directly but you see somebody happy and it makes you happy. Likewise, if you see somebody sad, it can make you sad. So all those indicate, you know, all those times where you see one of your friends start crying and you're like, don't you start crying. If you start crying, I'm gonna start crying. You know, it's just a uh, feedback loop. Um, those are vicarious emotional responses. So again, it's observational learning because you're observing the behavior, you're observing the emotion, and then you yourself, because of that observation are performing that emotion. So again, if your model is smiling, then you as an observer are going to experience happiness. So the model smiling is the emotional response. Your emotional response to that emotional response is a vicarious emotional response. So the model is smiling because of some external stimulus that occurred, and you are smiling because of that other person's emotional response. Importantly for our analysis uh, coming up, if the model is fearful, uh, that's their emotional response. We oftentimes will experience vicarious fear because we see somebody else experiencing fear. So if you, uh, you know, if a friend of yours ever came up to you and was like, oh my gosh, 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 and they just ran up to you and they're like, oh my gosh. Usually you're like, what, what, what happened, what happened, right? You're, fr you're frightened, you're scared. You're not sitting there going, ha, ha. What happened, right? You're, you feel that vicarious emotional response. So when we observe fear, uh, we typically also feel uh, fear. Incidentally, this is one of the reasons why uh, um, killing spiders in our house uh, is we try our best not to freak out. So uh, you know, when our children are like, oh look, there's a spider, 
instead of the natural reaction of, ah, you know, spider, we're kind of like, oh, really? Oh, there's a spider. Let me just, uh, you know, get my, uh, <laughs> my shoe here and take care of that. Because we don't want to have that emotional response of fear and thereby cause our children to have their vicarious emotional response of fear. So how is this used in the real world? Well, one area where it's used is in uh, horror movies. And it also explains uh, when, you, when you apply uh, gender roles analysis, it also explains why that uh, final girl or that final survivor is most often a female in our society. So let's take a look at how you can use observational learning and how it ties into classical conditioning. We'll go back to our, our textbook example here first uh, by taking a look at um, uh, revisiting Pavlov's dog. So if you have a model that's showing fear, initially, when we're young, let's assume that certain emotional expressions are not biologically um, uh, pre-programmed. Let's, let's just make that assumption for the ease of analysis. Your model showing fear when you are young is a neutral stimulus. So your model showing fear, making that face of, you know, when you're young, you might just think to yourself, it's a weird face. You know, I'm not scared of it. I'm not happy about it. It's a neutral stimulus. But think about when that model is going to show fear. That model is going to show that fearful uh, expression when a frightening event is around. So when that dog starts barking too loudly and the model, you know, usually your parents are like, oh, no. Or when, uh, you know, a ball is about to hit them in the face and they're like, ah, you know, they make that uh, fearful expression. Oftentimes, this frightening event, especially if you're a parent, is something that is happening to the actual child itself. So the dog has gotten too close, but it's gotten too close to your child. That ball's about to hit somebody in the face, but it's about to hit your face in the child. And most parents at that time have that fearful reaction, and they're like, ah, ah, you know, I've got to save my baby. Ah, I've got to save my child. Um, so we have this frightening event. That frightening event is the unconditioned stimulus. And in the observer, in the little child where the dog gets too close, they're going to have observer fear. And in that little child, when that ball's about to hit them in the face, that's one of the few things that children are naturally afraid of, things looming about to hit them in the face. That child will experience that fear. It's an unconditioned reaction to a real fearful stimulus. But this is going to happen over and over and over again. So when the child sees their mother or sees their father and there's a fearful expression and then they turn around and that dog is right there and it's barking at them, they're going to experience the unconditioned response of fear, but they just took a look at that neutral stimulus. So the two of them have been paired. When that ball is about to hit them in the face, they'll look back to their parents. They'll hit, hit in the face of the ball. They'll experience the fear. Once again, the model's fear is the neutral stimulus paired with a frightening event that leads the child to experience fear. What eventually happens is that model's fear becomes a conditioned stimulus. So the model's fear, through being paired with actual fear-inducing frightening events that cause real fear in those children, uh, that model's fear, that facial expression, becomes a conditioned stimulus for fear. And this leads to its ability to cause that vicarious emotional experience because later when that model fear is being presented by itself, when your friend walks up to you and says, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. And you're like, why? What? There's nothing here. I don't see any dogs. I don't see any, you know, uh, dangerous people. I don't see any. What's, what are you so afraid of? You don't have that response. You have the conditioned response of the observer feeling the fear. So now when you see fear, you feel fear. Now when you observe somebody's facial expression of fear, you feel fear, and that's that observational learning, that's that vicarious emotional response. So it's a phenomenon that comes out of classical conditioning. All right, any questions on that yet? Why we, when we, uh, a, a fearful face or an emotional face turns into a conditioned stimulus that then can elicit that emotion? 
Make sense so far? All right. So now we have that we have been conditioned so that fearful faces can cause fear in us, right? Seeing somebody afraid can cause fear in us. And this opens up the possibility to higher order conditioning. So this opens up the possibility of using that model sphere, that conditioned stimulus, as conditioned stimulus number one, and then using that to condition fear to a new neutral stimulus. And what horror films do is they come up with a movie character where you would not really observe any fear, right? So uh, prior to the Friday the 13th movie series, uh, most people did not freak out when they saw somebody in a hockey mask, right? You would see somebody walking towards you on the street in a hockey mask and you'd be like, there must be an arena around here somewhere. Maybe the pond is frozen open. You know, big deal. I'm not, it's a neutral stimulus. Uh, prior to it, most people were not afraid of people in clown suits with, with, you know, massive ruffles. So a movie character oftentimes starts off as a neutral stimulus. And when you see that movie character, you take a look at them and you're like, eh, it's not that bad. You know, I don't, I'm not afraid. I'm not, I don't like him. I don't hate him. I'm not that scared. So what they do in the movie itself is they will pair that movie character with characters, models, freaking out and showing fear. So that movie character will pop up and people in the movie, the actors in the movie, will model fear. They'll be like, no, and they'll be like, ah, and they'll be like, run away. They will model the fear. And through our previous classical conditioning, that model fear is a conditioned stimulus that leads to observer fear, the conditioned response. So in a movie, every single time that you see a character in that movie act afraid, you are being conditioned, classically conditioned, for that neutral stimulus of a movie character to turn into a conditioned stimulus. And this is done through higher order conditioning. And this is the technique. This is why they often have many victims in a horror film. This is often why uh, they'll, they'll have, you know, close-ups on their face to show their fearful expressions so that we can fear that, we can have that observer fear, that conditioned response. And then through repeated presentations, what happens is that movie character becomes a conditioned stimulus that on its own leads to the conditioned response in, a, in the observer of that observer fear. So eventually... When you see Jason Voorhees in his uh, hockey mask on screen, that is a scary moment. And eventually when you see Pennywise the Clown pop up, that is a scary moment because it's been conditioned, that stimulus has been conditioned to cause observer fear. All right, any questions on that procedure? Okay, so observer fear is, being, uh, is a conditioned response now for the movie character. But the last thing that you need in most of these movies is you need some protagonist. You need somebody to be the hero of the, uh, of the story, uh, to be the one that finally makes the stand against whatever the monster, uh, whoever the monster is. And because of the requirement of these characters showing fear, because of the requirement of these characters freaking out when the, uh, uh, when the uh, uh, monster appears, um, it requires both male characters and female characters to show that fear. Because otherwise, if the male characters did not show the fear, that would be a extinction procedure for this classical conditioning procedure. So everybody in a typical horror movie is afraid. Everybody is showing that fear. But they need somebody to overcome that fear uh, and stand up to the, um, to the villain, to the monster. And in our society, unfortunately... Males are not allowed to have that shift in their emotions. Males are not allowed to go from somebody who's being afraid, being labeled a coward, to being the eventual hero that's not accepted in our society. And because of that, it's always, well, not always, typically the final female, the final person standing is that final girl. So everybody has been showing fear throughout this entire show, this entire movie, males and females alike. But when it finally comes time for that courageous stand, when it finally comes time for the audience to identify with this person as a hero, 
Unfortunately, in our society, males who have shown cowardice, we're not uh, trained or uh, socialized to identify with them as heroes. So it remains the final girl to fulfill that hero role. And we see this in horror movies over and over again. So final female in Descent, that's a little bit of a cheat because that was an all female cast. Um, but in The Shining, we have, um, oh, her name just went out of my head. Anybody want to help me out? She played Olive Oil. Wait, where is he? Shelley Duvall. All right, so we have Shelley Duvall. And one of the reasons why this scene and this uh, movie is so terrifying uh, is because of faces like this that Shelley Duvall has. So she has those big eyes. She's got that, you know, large mouth. And when she makes a scared face, I mean, look at that. She is terrified. And Stanley Kubrick actually pressured her during the filming of this scene to the point where she almost had a nervous breakdown and they caught it on film. So that's one of the reasons why it's just so terrifying because really, otherwise, it's just, it's just Jack Nicholson. And honestly, most of you could probably take Jack Nicholson in a fight. I mean, he's not a big, huge, you know, uh, burly man. But when you take a look at Shelley Duvall doing that, just through observational learning, you're like, oh my gosh, this is like the scariest thing ever. And that's one of the reasons why this is such a uh, frightening movie. Uh, and then again, Scream, uh, the Scream series, typically you got one female that survives. Uh, typically the males, again, cannot show cowardice and then be identified as the hero. And if you've seen the Scream series, you might say to yourself, well, what about David Arquette? He is literally indestructible in that series, um, but he's there for comedic purposes. He's there to be laughed at. He's there as a source of, uh, of comedy. So we will allow ourselves to laugh at um, uh, males when they're, um, when they're showing fear. But again, he's not the hero of that series. Probably the most uh, famous final girl from the Halloween series, Jamie Lee Curtis. They rebooted that one again. She's come back for that again. Um, and you know, you just see this over and over in so many examples. So Ripley, the last survivor, you know, in most of the Aliens movies. And again, everybody freaks out in the Aliens movies. If you remember Aliens 2, I think it was uh, Bill Pullman. No, not Bill Pullman. It was the other actor uh, who was freaking out and he's sitting there and the aliens are attacking him. He's like, it's game over, man. It's game over. It's done. We're done, man. It's game over. He's not the hero. He doesn't survive. He's not allowed to because we can't identify him with him as a hero. All right. So that's why the final girl is often chosen uh, to be the survivor, chosen to be the hero in our society. Then again, it's because all the characters show fear to establish that movie uh, villain as a conditioned stimulus that will then elicit fear in us, making for that good horror experience. All right, so any questions on that so far? Make sense? Okay, so now we're going to get down to uh, Avengers and uh, use the same idea to understand why was it that Black Widow was a part of uh, the Avengers? And this question is very confusing until you understand observational learning, not because she was a part of the team. So you can clearly kind of see here that they had a bunch of male characters and I'm sure they thought to themselves, we want a female character in the group. Let's include some gender diversity. So we need a female character. Who do we want to use? The question isn't why did they use a female character? The question is why did they choose Black Widow? And that is especially confusing if you know the history of the Avengers, because one of the founding members of the Avengers, Captain America isn't even a founding member of the Avengers. So in the comics, one of the first members that came together in that first Avengers team was the Wasp. And it makes no sense whatsoever from any sort of historical point of view to not include the Wasp. Uh, over Black Widow. So why was Black Widow chosen? Instead of the Wasp, the Wasp was there from the beginning. She was there in Avengers number one. There she is right there. And uh, she was actually, I think, the third leader of the Avengers. So after, I think it was Iron Man was the first and then Captain America came in and he took over and he was the second leader. And when they were having uh, a discussion, she actually brought it up 
that she thinks it's time for somebody else to have a turn and she nominates herself and then there's all these objections and she kind of shuts them all down even Thor so she's a very strong very capable uh, female character and again one of the founding members of the Avengers so if you're going to include a movie that includes other founding members of the Avengers like Captain America sorry like uh, Thor like um, uh, Iron Man why was it that she wasn't chosen, the Wasp wasn't chosen, and Black Widow was? Well, the, the two things we need to know about that. Number one, one of the Wasp's powers is that, uh, if you've seen the, the movie uh, by now, uh, she can shrink down to small size. That's why she's called the Wasp. And she can also fly around. So you can see the wings here. So she can shrink down. She can fly around. That's one of her superpowers. Uh, the Black Widow, she doesn't have superpowers, she's just a highly trained uh, spy uh, with, you know, peak human abilities. So the last thing we need to know about why uh, the Black Widow was chosen was at that time, there was one character in the Avengers who had not yet been established in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So by the time Avengers came out, Iron Man had already had two movies. Thor had had a movie. Um, Captain America uh, had a movie. Uh, Black Widow was introduced in Iron Man 2. So everybody in that uh, in that movie, all the major characters, even Hawkeye was in uh, was in the Thor movie. They had all been established, and everybody in the audience kind of knew and was familiar with these characters. The only character that they weren't familiar with, the only character that was missing, was the Hulk. Now that's not because. The Hulk had not had movies before then. It was because his movies were horrible and they flopped. So if you ever take a look at any list of the worst movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, this one is, you know, the number one worst movie typically. Either this one or Thor number two. But the problem was is that nobody saw this Edward Norton movie and the box office was horrible um, and it's ignored, right? When is the... the uh, the events of that movie are never brought up. This was pre-Marvel Cinematic Universe. And if you ever want to see a movie that is directed amazing, but has a story that is horrible, check this movie out. Angly directed it. It is really visually interesting, but just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Both of them were box office bombs. I think this one holds one of the records for the steepest second week drop of all time. Anyways, they had a Hulk problem. Nobody had really experienced the Hulk in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Nobody really experienced the menace of the Hulk. Nobody really had experienced the terror that the Hulk should be induced. Nobody really experienced the danger that the Hulk uh, as a character uh, was supposed to uh, evoke. So how do you fix this? Well, you choose somebody in the Avengers to experience uh, or interact with the Hulk and show massive amounts of fear. And the character that they chose for that was the Black Widow. So let's take a look at the two scenes and that kind of illustrate this. I did not remember to embed these, so we will just, let me set all that up. All right, so we'll start off by taking a look at a trailer for the Avengers, just to kind of once again show you how out of place the Black Widow actually was in that movie. And then we will show you the scene, one of the scenes that she was placed in there for the reason of establishing the Hulk as the menace that his previous movies we're just not able to do. War has started. And we are hopelessly outgunned. Director Fury, I think it's time.
here with the mission, sir. Trying to get him back in the world. Trying to save it. Doctor, I need you to come in. What if I say no? I'll persuade you. What it was for me to do. It's called the Avengers Mission. I thought I'd be qualified. Apparently, I'm just volatile, self obsessed, and I don't play well with others. You need a timeout. How desperate are you? It's cool, such lost creatures. All right, so just as an example there. So number one, uh, take a look at all, you know, all the established characters. They're all doing heroic things. Take a look at uh, Nick Fury and the emotion that he's allowed to uh, represent. So when when uh, Loki is like, how desperate are you that you call upon these, you know, people to defend you? And he's like, oh, I am really desperate. You know, I can't remember the last time that a student came to my uh, to my class or to my office hour and they're like, oh, I got this exam coming up and I'm really desperate to pass. Right. It's always like I got to I got to pass this exam. Right. Fear is the correct response there. But he's a male hero and he's not allowed. All right, so let's pause this and just check it out for a second, right? So this is, again, an indication of how out of place the Black Widow was in this particular movie universe. So we just saw the Hulk, all right? Hulk's roaring. Most powerful, uh, strongest uh, one that there is, all right? We got Iron Man coming in, all right, with his uh, highly technological uh, suit of armor. We got Hawkeye with his trick array of uh, arrows, explosive arrows and all that kind of cool stuff. We got Thor uh, yielding Mjolnir, the most powerful weapon uh, in the Marvel Universe. We got Black Widow with a pistol she bought at a local gun show. And finally we have Captain America with his unbreakable shield, right? One of those is not like the other. And check out this scene right here. I'm bringing a party to you. All right, so it was subtle, but take a look at the difference in the reactions. We got Tony Stark being chased by a city-destroying ship from the alien uh, attacking Armada. And how does he react to it? He's like, hey, guys, I'm bringing the party to you. He's like, guys, I'm bringing the party to you. Not, oh, my gosh, guys, this the thing is coming to me and it's going to kill us all. Save me, save me. I'm totally out of a match. No. Just like, hey, you know what? We're about to die. This is extremely dangerous. Guys, I'm bringing the party to you. Even the Black Widow. It's subtle, but she has more of that kind of face, right? Right at the end. Because, again, they need to establish that this is a massive threat. So that was a trailer. But then in the movie, remember, I told you that they had a Hulk problem. And in the movie, this was the scene that I think the Black Widow was written into the Marvel Cinematic Universe for. Uh, let's see if I can get rid. Oh, at least we get rid of a few of them. There we go. All right, this was the scene that she got written in there for because up until here, the Hulk had not transformed. So this is the first Hulk transformation. And notice that when he does it, he's there with the Black Widow and watch her face during this entire scene. Uh, take a look at how often she shows fear. Oh. Bruce, you gotta fight it. This is just a Loki box. 
You'll be able to get this name. I'm going to be okay. Right? On my life, I will get you out of this. You will walk away and never have a heart. So notice, not like, yo, Bruce, I swear I'm going to save you from this. We're going to walk away. No problem. I'm bringing the party to you. No, you can hear her voice. She's barely holding it together. She's like, Bruce, I'm telling you, I swear I will hold it together. Again, showing fear to establish the Hulk as the, the massive danger that he could be. So watch her face in this uh, in this sequence. She's not bringing the party to you. She is doing the correct emotional response for this situation. She's freaking out. But what they're doing is they're presenting you with the Hulk. That's the neutral stimulus up until this point because nobody saw his movies. They're presenting you with the Black Widow. She is modeling fear now for everybody. And that face gets attached to that neutral stimulus, turns it into the... Continu uh, the um, uh, condition stimulus and then by itself the Hulk will give you that emotional uh, response of ooh this guy is you know impressive this guy is something to deal with and that was Thor and now look at her she is an emotional wreck at this point. She's trying to recover using her training. Again, it's the proper emotional response, but it's being modeled here to establish the Hulk as a threat. Is anybody copy? Copy. All right. So again, the question was, why choose Black Widow instead of choosing the... Um, uh, instead of choosing uh, the wasp, and the reason was is, is pretty much that scene. So if that happened to the wasp, the wasp would have looked at Bruce Banner and she would have been like, Bruce, you know, we'll get you through this. We'll, we'll save you. Don't worry. You know, I promise you on my life. And Bruce would have been like, on your life. And she would have been like, oh, she would have, <laughs> she would have shrunk down to a small size. She would have flown through one of the vents. And she would have said, I am not capable of dealing with this right now. I don't think anybody is. Maybe we should call Thor. Thor is the one that eventually does come. But that would have been her response. That would have done nothing to establish the Hulk as the threat that he needed to be. That would have done nothing to change that neutral stimulus into the conditioned stimulus that elicits these, uh, these experiences of fear. However, the Black Widow was the character that they chose instead. And that face, when the Hulk was transforming... Again, is that conditioned stimulus that elicits fear. This is somebody experiencing actual fear. This makes us experience vicarious emotional response of fear. Pair that with that neutral stimulus of the Hulk. And through repeated you know, examples of this, we get to change the Hulk from a neutral stimulus into a conditioned stimulus that will elicit fear uh, in us. So to show you the effectiveness of this uh, entire scene, uh, this was, I, I took my nephew to go see um, The Avengers uh, when it first came out, 
And uh, he is, he was, I think like eight at the time, I believe. Anyways, this was the only time he grabbed my arm through the entire film. This is the only time he kind of like hung on. And I was like, I'm sure she'll be fine. I was a little worried myself. But um, anyways, highly effective scene, but the Black Widow had to be chosen uh, in order to establish the Hulk as this, uh, this massive threat. And then, uh, you know, it had to have been the Black Widow, number one, because many other superheroines could have dealt with the situation. It wouldn't have been as much of a threat. And then number two, in our society, again, we're not that uh, conditioned or we're not that socialized to accept males as heroes if they have ever shown fear before. And when I was putting this together the first time around, I took a look at the trailer for Avengers 2. And this was the scene in the forest when uh, they're being attacked with this uh, gun made out of uh, one of the uh, cosmic cubes, one of the, the blue Tesseract energy. And it is literally just annihilating everything. It's like, you know, disintegrating everything. And you take a look at the faces and, uh, you know, Hawkeye's not selling it. He's sitting there and he's all determined. He's like, oh, there's a gun that could destroy my entire being here. All right, what am I doing? I'm not afraid. So not showing fear. Uh, Iron Man getting choked out by Thor. Again, look of determination. But Black Widow seeing something off screen, and that's her face right there. So again, she's used in these films, she's used in these movies in order to establish uh, these neutral stimuli as condition stimuli that then cause a conditional response of fear. Mm -hmm. Do you writers like know how it is like when you're writing the movie? Like the like, guy who really the artist and um, the They know, uh, it, it's hard to tell how much they know in terms of have they sat in a psychology class like this and, and said to themselves, uh, oh, I'm going to use this you know, psychology phenomenon versus this is just uh, practices that they have found effective and they've been reinforced for using over time. So it's, it's hard to tell how much of one is, you know, and how much of the other one it is. But it is, um, I mean, it is the psychology reason behind why these things uh, work. It is a psychological reason behind why these things occur. And uh, on a kind of related note, it is nice to see that uh, these days there seems to be more and more um, instances of the male protagonist, the male character, who shows fear and then ends up being the hero at the end. So one of the examples that comes to mind just from the Marvel Cinematic Universe is uh, Tony Stark in Iron Man 3 where at the beginning of the movie, he's got post-traumatic stress disorder because of what happened in New York uh, during the attack. And then by the end of the movie, again, he's being heroic and he's being uh, brave. So it is nice to see that there seems to be this shift, you know, in, uh, in uh, culture's acceptance of these previously kind of rigid gender roles. But uh, the principle is, is the same. You need somebody to show fear if you want to establish a character as or if you want a character to uh, evoke fear in your audience. You need somebody to, you know, uh, show affection if you want a, a character to uh, evoke affection in your audience. That's why one of the things that, uh, if, you, if you're ever watching a movie and, uh, you know, uh, they have a character that you don't like and they want you at some point to switch from not liking them to liking them, oftentimes what they do is they just show that this person has a love interest. They just got somebody that loves them, whether it's their wife, whether it's their, um, whether it's their uh, mother. So in, uh, has anybody seen Shape of Water? So the, um, the security guy, Michael Shannon's character in Shape of Water, when they're at the, uh, at the uh, research area, I won't ruin too much, but when they're at the research area, you can tell that he's just a hard-nosed, no-nonsense, mean person, right? He's like just this mean, you know, uh, he tortures the, the fish man. Uh, he's just this mean individual, and you don't like him at all. But then as soon as he gets home, and his kids are like, Daddy, and his wife is like, oh, did you have a hard time at work? And he's like, yeah, it was, it was tough. And all his kids are like, can I show you my homework? And, you know, can we do this? And he's like, oh, yeah, let's do this. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, he's kind of, you know. And you can't help it, right? You see these people loving him, and you're like, oh, there's my automatic, vicarious emotional response, right? Because when you were a child, and your parents walked up to somebody and they said, oh, my gosh, it's so good to see you. Oh, my gosh, you know, it's great to see you. Oh, I haven't seen you in so long. I love you. This is great. 
you learned as a child that that person is probably going to be nice to you, right? They only hug and were nice to the nice people. So that was probably the one that the person that was going to be like, hey, would you like a candy? Here you go. And you learn to have those vicarious emotional responses in that same way. So it works across the board. And it is interesting to take a look at storytelling techniques because the effective ones will line up with what psychologists know about how our minds work. And this is just one of those examples. So I'm sure that uh, there were stories or movies where the male protagonist was the one that was freaking out. And at the end, the male protagonist became the hero and they tried it in focus groups and, or they tried it in, in the theaters and the focus groups were like, mm -mm, I don't like it. And the theaters were like, nobody's coming to see this movie. So it was through kind of this reinforcement um, operational conditioning. Of, I'll try this technique of screenwriting. Oh, and I got reinforced with this box office success. I'll try this technique of screenwriting and who I don't get reinforced. Um, that I think just led to these tropes, but there is that hard psychological basis to them. And this is one of the reasons why, A, people show fear in films, and up until very recently, now it's shifting. B, it was prim uh, primarily women who survived. So males would show fear. There's a lot of corpses in these slasher films of guys who showed fear, but they're not allowed to be that final survivor. They're not allowed to be that hero. All right, any other questions, comments about the use of observational learning in movies? All right, so what I'm gonna do uh, right now is um, we're going to uh, take a look at observational learning and operational um, operating conditioning. We're gonna start with it, uh, just kind of introduce the idea, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish it up at a later time. But uh, just to kind of introduce the idea, observational learning and operating conditioning. These are um, uh, reasons why or, or um, criteria for why observational learning will occur. So what's going to make it more likely to occur and what's going to make it less likely to occur? What's going to make it more likely that you observe an individual and your mind says copy that behavior, do that behavior, versus you see an individual and your mind says no. So we're going to take a look at uh, factors that affect acquisition. And acquisition is the um, getting of the knowledge to perform that behavior. So it's kind of like the how to perform that behavior. So acquisition is gaining the knowledge, the how to of performing the behavior. And then the performance part of it is the actual doing of the behavior. So there's two, there's two components that are required in order for the behavior to be able to be done. So for example, just kind of set it up for next time. When Shira held aloft her mighty sword, right, and uh, did that particular behavior, in order for Isabella to do that behavior, to uh, copy that behavior, in order for her to go through observational learning, number one, she had to gain the knowledge of how to do the behavior in the first place. So if she could not pick up a stick, if she did not have the ability to pick up a stick and, and had the coordination to hold it over her head, then she would be lacking in acquisition, right? So the acquisition part of it is the actual how to, you know, cause that transformation. You take the stick, you pick it up. This is how you do it. The other aspect of it is the performance aspect of it. So this is the will you actually do the behavior. So there's reasons why Isabella chose to do this behavior, right? So once she learned it, once she's like, oh, okay, that's how you do it. The second half of observational learning is her actually going out there and saying, all right, now I will do it. Now I will perform that behavior. So the next time we meet, we're going to uh, answer some of these questions about acquisition and performance. And uh, what I would uh, like you to think about before uh, next class is in terms of acquisition and, and performance, one of the kind of mysteries that we're going to take a look at is what are the uh, characteristics that cause acquisition and performance? And importantly, it is not exposure to the behaviors. And the reason that we know this, or, or a nice example of this, is that Shira is the main character in the Shira show, right? She's called Shira, Princess of Power. So Shira is the main character. But in terms of on-air screen time, 
in terms of exposure to characters in that show, she is one of three main characters uh, that appear in that show. So Shira is one of them. She gets a ton of screen time. Another one that gets a ton of screen time is Bo over here. And uh, I love that. Number one, he's like the only male character in the Rebellion. And number two, uh, he wears this nice little eye candy outfit, uh, which does not protect anything at all, right? So the soft underbelly is all exposed over there. So whenever those criticisms of female armor come up in, in various conversations, my mind immediately goes to poor Bo with no protection whatsoever. But Bo is one of the other major characters that gets a ton of screen time. Isabella did not imitate Bo. She did not go through observational learning with Bo. Hordak is another one that has a ton of screen time. And he also has behaviors such as pretending that his arm is a rocket cannon. And Isabella did at no point was walking around going psh, 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 or doing anything like that. So the question that we're going to answer next time is that why, when she was presented with all three of these, you know, two of them were heroes, right? Only one of them was a villain. Uh, why was it that when she was presented with all three of these for large amounts of time, she went through observational learning with Shira as the model, but she did not do it for Bo and she did not do it for Hordak. So that's what we're going to take a look at uh, next time. And uh, that will be uh, the end of it for today. So um, once again, if you did not get... Um, if you did not get at least 50% on your Stiffy assignments, you can hand them in for the last chance deadline. Uh, check the syllabus for more information and uh, enjoy your Thanksgiving break.